You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. Today's episode, John is joined by Dr. Constantine Bettigin, Assistant Professor of Planetary Science at California Institute of Technology. Dr. Bettigin graduated with a bachelor's degree in astrophysics in 2008. He won the Lawrence Deck Award for his thesis, The Dynamical Stability of the Solar System. He is on the 2015 Forbes list of 30 scientists under 30 who are changing the world. Constantine Batigan, welcome back to the program. Hey, thanks. It's great to be back. Now, Constantine, eccentricity with Planet Nine, messing around with the Kuiper Belt in ways that hadn't been realized until your new paper. Give us an overview about the ideas that Planet Nine may be more eccentric than was originally envisioned. Look, the simple story is in the thousands of calculations that we had run to date, we viewed the solar system really as an isolated object, right? As far as our simulations were concerned, it was the universe. But of course, that's not true. And that's not how the solar system formed. The solar system formed in a dynamic environment with thousands of other sun-like stars and, you know, smaller and bigger stars all forming together in a cluster. In such a cluster, an inescapable consequence of planet formation is that you create this almost spherical, quasi, I would say, go as far as to say maybe quasi-toroidal, quasi-spherical structure, cloud around the solar system filled with icy debris that we conventionally now call the Oort cloud, particularly the inner Oort cloud. If planet nine is there, this Oort cloud does not simply remain static. Instead, it gets re-injected back into the solar system. And if this process is active, this means that at the quantitative level, our simulations that we have performed to date were incomplete. And if you account for this effect, this would mean that Planet Nine, in order to match the data that we see right now, would have to be marginally more eccentric than we previously thought. Now, does this uh, support an origin? Say Planet Nine's there. Mm-hmm. Does it support any kind of an origin for it? As in, does the eccentricity indicate that it could be an ejected object from the inner solar system or a captured object from somewhere else? It's a tough question to answer simply because if you go through the possibilities for how Planet Nine could have acquired its final orbit, there are three that you can immediately put on the table. The first is that it formed where it is. The second is that it got captured. And the third is that it got ejected from sort of the Uranus, Neptune, Jupiter, and Saturn planet formation region and was perturbed somehow onto a more circular orbit than it originated with. Of those three, only the final one is plausible. The reason is that in order to form where it is, protoplanetary disk, the solar system would have had to extend to a sort of absurd distances. And, and we simply don't see planetary disks, protoplanetary disks as large as that. Other reasons why in the solar system in particular, we think the disk ended at about Neptune's current orbit, but I think it's not worth it to, to go into that in too much detail. The capture story is one that's really interesting from kind of a sci-fi point of view. It definitely would make the best screenplay, but unfortunately it doesn't work on a quantitative level because the same, it's kind of sort of like the same encounters with stars that could could lead to a passing star dropping off planet nine in the sun's orbit. The next encounter would have an equally large probability of stripping Planet Nine away. So it's a, it's a highly unlikely way to create Planet Nine. The third scenario, where it forms kind of where Uranus and Neptune are, and then gets ejected and then gets circularized, is one that 
is plausible, but I should say at the detailed level, the probabilities there also require a very specific type of star cluster for it to work well. And if it formed in the solar system, in that sort of region where Neptune and Uranus and all that formed, at the time in the early solar system, that was closer into the sun, right? Uh, yeah, that's right. So this would have been sort of 10 AU, kind of close to where Saturn is right now. Maybe marginally bigger than that, but not too much. So indeed, the solar system started out in a more compact configuration. And then within the first maybe 10, maybe 100 million uh, years, suffered a dynamical instability wherein the planets kind of migrated out through a stochastic process. So indeed, this would have been somewhat closer to the sun than Neptune is today. So to speculate, to imagine what Planet mm -hmm. Nine might be like, could it simply be like an ice giant, like Uranus or Neptune, that, that just ended up way out there through gravitational <laughs> interaction? Is that more likely, or is it going to be more like a Kuiper Belt object where it's actually rocky? I mean, can we infer anything based on that? Well, look, as far as the what the calculations can tell you, right? The, the type of calculations that we do, all they can tell you is a mass and an orbit, right? They cannot tell you if Planet Nine is a five Earth mass burrito or a five Earth mass rock or a five Earth mass ice ball or, or really anything. It can even be a five Earth mass wire that traces out its orbit, that the gravi gravitational consequences of that would still produce the signatures that we see in the distant Kuiper belt. That said, as you, as you mentioned, to speculate, if we kind of imagine that Planet Nine is one of the embryos involved in the planet formation process through which you build up Uranus and Neptune, then we would indeed expect it to have a large icy mantle with a with a subdominant fraction of it being composed of rock. Here I need to give credit where it's due, which is to a paper by Isidoro, Andre Isidoro and collaborators, which came out before all this Planet Nine stuff was hot, and this must have been 2015 or so, the problem that Andre and company were working on is actually formation of Uranus and Neptune. And they had imagined that Uranus and Neptune form from sort of collisions of few Earth mass planetary embryos, you know, sort of say five Earth mass objects. Now, what they found is that in their calculations, the accretion process was not 100% efficient, which of course, it's reasonable. You should never expect the accretion process to be 100% efficient. And in their case, some of these embryos would get scattered out, right? And as they would get scattered out, because the solar system would be in a cluster, they went as far as to write in their paper that through this process, one might expect there to be a five or so Earth mass icy embryo hanging out at hundreds of AU with a marginally eccentric orbit as this is just a natural consequence of building Uranus and Neptune. So I think from as far as the different variants of the planet formation story go, this one is, uh, is, is the most likely for Planet Nine's genesis. You say the word embryo, as in, as in this is some mm -hmm. sort of primordial core of, 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 a, of maybe a failed gas giant, something like that. What would that tell us if we had such a thing? I mean, what would that reveal about the the origin of the planets in the solar system? Because, I mean, if you look at Earth, it's kind of hard to tell much because Earth is always resurfacing itself. And, you know, obviously Mars did that, Venus. Do we have a, a chance of getting a glimpse of the early solar system from such an object? Right. So... I think that it goes even beyond that because suppose, you know, tomorrow we discover, or by we, I mean the, the global we, not necessarily us, but somebody discovers planet nine. The moment you know where it is on the sky, you can interrogate it with a whole range of instruments with, with things like the Hubble telescope, with, with Keck, with whatever. Then you can study in as up close as it gets perhaps the most typical planetary mass object that exists in the galaxy as far as we know. Because after all, what 
the last three decades have revealed to us and, and the search for exoplanets has demonstrated is that the most common outcome of planet formation is not Jupiter or Saturn. As far as we can see, it's not the Earth, right? It's an object which is marginally uh, smaller than Neptune and marginally bigger than the Earth, namely sort of five Earth masses. That's a typical outcome of, of planet formation. That's if we find Planet Nine, it'll be the closest window that we'll have into into seeing what exoplanets really look like. That's interesting. Now, okay, if Planet Nine is uh, essentially super Earth, whatever its nature is, terrestrial or non, and whatever, and it shows us, you know, basically the most common type of planet we see in the universe. Have we seen any exoplanet or star systems that have a planet, an ejected planet that's way out there? in a sort of the same position as Planet Nine would be. Yes, we have. In fact, this was a relatively recent paper. I, I admit, I forget the, the license plate of this particular exoplanet, but it is an exoplanet that basically occupies Planet Nine-like orbit. I, if I remember correctly, I think it was HD 106906 but I might be mistaken. Basically, you know, it's it's a thing that goes around its host star every 10,000 years and has a marginally eccentric orbit. Now there, the, we think we there's a pretty clear understanding of, of how it got there, and it basically follows this exact story that I mentioned just a few minutes ago. You see, the the host star in that system is a is a binary. So the planet would have been scattered out by a binary and because like most stars this star would have also formed in a birth cluster right the passing the effects of the passing stars as well as the cumulative sort of tidal gravitational effect of the cluster would have detached it from the binary and it would have parked on a planet at nine like orbit so it's it's interesting to see that this process that you know within the solar system mostly comes, you know, we mostly know about it through simulations, indeed appears to to be active and, and work uh, rel relatively well in the galaxy more broadly. One question that's been popping up recently regarding Planet Nine is observational bias, mm -hmm. and that we might have, a, maybe, it's been suggested that maybe there's a bias and when we look at these objects that appear to have been perturbed by Planet Nine. Could you go into that and explain what that is and why it probably isn't. Yeah, of course. So, you know, to be clear, this is the bias issue is not a new issue and it's not controversial in the sense that, you know, is there bias or is there not? There absolutely is bias in any observational survey, right? That is that is a fact. And even five years ago, this was something, uh, this was a discussion that, we were having with our colleagues, you know, the clustering that we see of the distant Kuiper Belt objects. Is it, is it real? Now, there are two ways to attack this question, right? One, quest, one way to attack this question of whether or not there's bias is to do what's called survey simulation, where you say, okay, I know exactly where my surveys looked and I can simulate what they should have seen what we see, is it consistent with their observational history or is it is it not, right? And doing the exercise this way for the distant solar system basically gets you to an inconclusive answer. Particularly, this is because the two best characterized surveys, which are the, the OSAS and the DES uh, surveys, are also the most biased. And in the case of the DES survey, where the telescope was pointed, in fact, happens to align very, very well with where the cluster is. So the, the basic answer to all of these analyses dating back to uh, 2017, as well, as well as one from uh, 2020, and there's a new recent one by, uh, led by Kevin Napier and, and company, is that doing the exercise this way, you can't tell. You can't tell if the orbits are clustered, you can't tell if they're uniform, and that's not surprising. This is because this individual surveys have only limited, uh, have only searched a very limited part of the sky, okay? 
Now, the other way to do this exercise is to abandon the survey simulation approach and do what's called observability mapping. And observability mapping basically forgets about who discovered what, right? And just says, let's look at the census of discoveries on the sky of Kuiper Belt object, a Kuiper Belt objects that are, you know, distant, distant broadly defined, meaning say semi-major axis greater than 50 AU or 100 AU. If you do it this way, you have actually a huge sample, right? You have something like a thousand uh, points on the night sky that are pretty uniformly distributed across the sky. And then you can ask the question, if, if you were to have a uniformly distributed set of very distant orbits, right, the ones that appear clustered, would you be able to, would the cumulative, you know, observational effort that is, that led to the discovery of all of these objects, would that effort have discovered this uniformly distributed population? The answer there is, is pretty statistically significant. What you get at the end of the day is that the false alarm probability for clustering is something like 0.2%. Okay, so it, it's different ways of doing the exercise. One, it, the you know sur survey simulation approach is one that would be better if this sample was was larger. But of course, the sample of well, very well characterized KBOs is not very large at all. It's something like fourteen objects, so it kind of falls short of being definitive. The observability mapping approach. Uh, takes advantage of the large comparison sample. And from that, even though it's less ideal in some sense, it can give you better uh, statistical you know, uh, inference power. Does that make sense? It does. Now, another thing that's come up is uh, there have been a few suggestions that maybe it's not a planet and it's something else. And the first question in this, in this, uh, in this group is, how about a group of objects? as opposed to a single planet. Could there be sort of a cloud of objects collectively affecting the objects in the outer solar system? Or would that simply have long ago collapsed into a planet? Yeah, okay. So as I mentioned maybe 10 or so minutes ago, as far as the calculations go, we cannot tell what Planet 9 is. And indeed, replacing Planet 9 with a you know, gravitate, with, with a gravitationally charged wire, if you will, a, a, a wire of mass that traces out its elliptical orbit would give you the same dynamics. Mathematically, that's true. And we even make that approximation sometimes for the kind of analytic uh, models that we have in our hierarchy of calculations. The question then becomes, is that astrophysically plausible? So if you go to the route of saying, Planet Nine is really not a planet. It is a ring of material. You are in, invoking an, a kind of a lopsided ring of material to explain why the distant Kuiper belt is, all, is a less massive lopsided ring of material. So, so you, you kind of are back to the question of what keeps the coherence of this forcing 10 Earth or so Earth mass ring of material in a kind of structured, uniformly eccentric way. There are ideas out there, you know, for how to do this. And, uh, you know, this has been work uh, done both by group of Anne-Marie Madigan at uh, University of Colorado in Boulder, as well as some group by Jihad Tuma and collaborators. And it's it's very, very interesting. And I think that, you know, there's a mathematical way to to replace Planet Nine with material with a ring of material. I don't think it, it makes very much sense from this sort of solar system, you know, formation point of view or or really the long term evolution of the solar system. But it but it's a it's a possibility that you cannot rule out a priori. You cannot rule out rule it out a priori you know you can only sort of rule it out based upon existence of of other patterns yeah. so it, you could end up with a planet nine turned out to be a, a lopsided ring of material being shepherded by planet 10 
<laughs> right, right. So, I mean, it's it's sort of that, you know, it's that mode of gravity, what we call secular interactions, which basically allows you to get away without knowing or specifying really even where planet nine is that allows for this analogy to work. The way to think about it qualitatively is that along many, many orbits, right, the Kuiper Belt objects will sample planet nine at every you know, orbital position that it takes, right? So it's like kind of like taking a movie, you know, filming a movie of the outer solar system and, and running it in on fast forward so that the orbits trace out, the individual objects trace out little rings or little ellipses. Gravity turns out actually works like that, wherein if you take the Hamiltonian and average out the fast interacting terms, you get to that description and when you get to that description it doesn't matter if it's a planet or or you know a thousand little test part or a thousand little dust particles that all uh, stretch out along its orbit it's a beautiful thing now the uh as far as the possibilities regarding planet nine the the elephant in the room the primordial black hole (laughs) hypothesis do you think that that's even really realistically possible Look, I have to once again, you know, invoke the fact that we can't, we don't know anything about what Planet Nine is from the calculations, right? So the calculations again only tell us the mass, only tell us the orbit. Are primordial black holes real in the first place? Now, there is an expectation that uh, black holes of a spectrum of masses should have been generated during you know, the very early stages of the universe. Right. So such a black hole would be, you know, a product not of the usual stellar evolution, the way you make kind of normal black holes that are, you know, a couple solar masses plus. So yeah, there is an there's a kind of hypothesized route to make such objects. Are so you know, do we expect such an ob do we expect their number density to be so high that we would expect one to be in our own backyard. My understanding of the numbers is that it's kind of unlikely. But of course, with these types of questions, there's a huge amount of room for turning knobs and uh, and there's a huge amount of room for, for error, if you will. And the cool thing about this is that the elephant in the room would be like the size of a baseball or something. Right? So it'd be a pretty compact and pretty massive elephant. But yeah, while it's not, again, something that you can a priori say with infinite confidence does not exist, I think a planet might just be a somewhat more, somewhat more kind of, you know, basic explanation for, for what we see. Still, though, you got to, one must admit, having a small black hole in the outer solar system, that would be one very interesting object to study up close. You know, it it sure would it would be really really cool the the process the problem with that is if it's if it's indeed a primordial black hole we'll never find it you know what i mean like we'll, we'll or at least even if we do find it it'll be long after i'm uh, i'm dead and i'm planning to live a long time so you know it, it's one of these things that where it's hard enough to pin down a planet on on the night sky pinning down where a primordial black hole is on the night sky is, is getting into the impossible territory now capture dynamics in the outer solar system so mm-hmm. it seems likely that that planet nine would be a member of our solar system having been born here but what about other kuiper belt objects is it possible to capture smaller objects now i know that there's you know we can sort of dynamics with jupiter and things like this allow us to capture interstellar objects and there are a couple candidates for that but what about the outer solar system is there even really a mechanism i mean could we capture some part of another star system's or cloud yeah so you know generically while you are in the in the disk so i'm sorry while you are in the cluster while the solar system is in its birth cluster there is an exchange of of material that's going on it is a little bit like a daycare center where the uh, you know, the germs indeed do not stay confined to a particular kid. They they spread pretty well. Is there a mechanism for this? Yes, you could imagine uh, a mechanism, in fact, that involves Jupiter. So suppose some other star loses asteroids, 
That's easy to do. They get ejected by the planets on that star system, then they are floating around. Then one gets close to our solar system and, in fact, hap uh, you know, starts uh, interacting with Jupiter and, and, and scatters off of Jupiter. Now it's in a situation where it's got an elongated orbit, which is tethered to the gravity of Jupiter. Then, if you then go back to the same process that we mentioned earlier and say, okay, you've got passing stars, which can perturb it, you can give it a little kick at aphelion from a passing star and you've circularized it. Now you've created a stable object with a large semi-major axis in orbit around the sun, which came from elsewhere. Such a process is easy to imagine. The question is, how efficient is this production mechanism? And the answer is not efficient at all. Now, looking for Planet Nine, we have a host of new instruments coming along soon. Mm -hmm. Actually, quite a few big telescopes. And then, of course, we've got the Vera Rubin Observatory and hopefully James Webb. What is the, the instruments that you're looking for to try to get some time on to directly look for Planet Nine? Well, I think that the here by far the the main kind of game changer is going to be Vera Rubin because Vera Rubin with with pretty astonishing efficiency will scan the sky over and over and over again. That's that's what we need to discover planet 9. Moreover, it goes down pretty deep above 23rd magnitude. That's that's good. Planet 9 might there's a there's a possibility that planet nine might be dimmer than that I, I sure hope it isn't but but you know barring that possibility Vera Rubin should have a pretty good chance of discovering planet nine even if not Vera Rubin will you know discover uh, I, I don't actually know the precise expected number but I think it's it's more than an order the more than an order of magnitude more distant Kuiper belt objects than we see at the moment so I think that's going to be really cool. That's going to sort of refine the the theoretical mo models further, and it's going to be kind of the next generation, no, you know, leap in mapping out the structure of the of the outer solar system. This is not to say, by the way, that Vera Rubin will not have you know observational biases of its own. It will, just like any survey. But I think that the sheer numbers of discoveries should overwhelm any uncertainties that come from that. Regarding Vera Rubin, mm -hmm. or what, it, also the LSST, was mm -hmm. what a large synaptic survey telescope, that is gonna basically automatically do the observations for you, right? So you'll just have to yeah. search through the data that it's collecting and, and essentially look look for movement. Now, we'll, I, I assume you'll do this in, in a computerized way. I, I doubt you'll be dusting off Clyde Tombaugh's blink comparator, so you <laughs> spend five years looking for the thing. Do you think you got a good chance once that, that first light happens and research happens with uh, Vera Rubin, do you think you have a good chance of finding Planet Nine relatively quickly and straightforwardly? Yeah, I think it's sort of, uh, you know, the time scale that I imagine is, is maybe you know, years, not certainly not decades. I think it's, you know, about higher than months on the order of years and smaller than decades. So yeah, I'm, I'm really, really excited about Vera Rubin coming online. And, uh, you know, one other cool thing is a lot of the data, or maybe all the data is, is public from what I understand. So it's, it's going to be, it's going to be quite a treasure trove. I wonder if they could do citizen science with it. In other words, like they do with Planet Hunters or tests, where you can actually in, involve the public to actually look through and see, you know, right. um, if things move. I wonder if they'll do that. I haven't heard anything. Yeah, I would be surprised if there isn't something that they do which involves the public. I think, you know, one of the really phenomenal things about astronomy is there is a strong push for getting the public involved. Uh, there's a strong push for, for outreach. So, yeah, I would be surprised if that wasn't part of the story, especially because, you know, the, the general public really resonates with with the solar system, just like uh, just like we we do as kind of professional scientists. So I think that I would assign sort of a high high likelihood to that being something one could get involved in as a as a citizen scientist if they wanted to. 
Now, you recently did a collaboration with a, a Miami Symphony, was it? <laughs> uh, tell us about that. Music and Planet Nine. Yeah, so this was a this was something that started, I guess, back in 2018, and you know this uh, this came out of a friendship with the conductor of the Miami Symphony, Eduardo Martorell, who is a you know I mean people like to throw around the word genius, like oh somebody's a genius, somebody is a you know a genius for this for that. I mean the guy's really truly a musical genius, and I don't mean this in like the Kanye way right he doesn't go around announcing that he's one but but the, having worked with him it truly is phenomenal to see how he writes music so he got inspired by the planet nine hypothesis to extend the planets uh, the the planet suite to include a planet nine symphony and i was of course very very excited about this but uh you know it was a it was a true kind of humbling moment where he said, okay, I wrote the thing, uh, the lead part is the guitar part and you should play it. And so, you know, I must admit it was, uh, it was one of the coolest things I've ever done. It was also super hard to play because part, parts of the, uh, the guitar part are, are, uh, well, as I say, they're, they're more complex than the, uh, than the music that, you know, we play with our, with our punk band. So, you know, it was really, a learning experience and, and I had a tremendous amount of fun doing it but we just recently completed the recording of it and there's a video on YouTube where you know it's the symphony playing and me playing in LA we recorded it asynchronously and the final product was sent to to the International Space Station just about you know 3 weeks ago where I assume was the high likelihood that that they must have blasted it in the you know in the space station i wouldn't see why they wouldn't so yeah it was a really really out of this world and cool experience tell us uh tell us about your punk band uh do you like write songs about the solar system other than planet nine you know we write songs but none of them are about the solar system i mean there's there's exactly zero overlap in content between the, between the solar system or or really anything astrophysical and the and the and the content of music that we play that said everybody in the band is is involved with astronomy so i play you know guitar and i sing and eric petigura who's a professor of astronomy and astrophysics at ucla is on you know, guitar john zinc is also an astronomer on the drums, uh, you know, in the really in the last, I don't know, five years or so in the in the kind of overall rotating lineup of the band between, you know, Chris Rollins on the bass and Chris Spalding on guitar and Gabriele uh, Picchieri on on the bass, like there wasn't anybody who wasn't somehow involved with with something in the physical sciences. Now the band's name is The Seventh Season, right? That's right. Yeah, it is music to some ears. Music to some ears. All right, Constantine, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, and I wish you well in searching for Planet Nine and above and beyond a primordial black hole. It would be absolutely amazing if it was a five-Earth mass frozen burrito. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks, John, for having me on. It's always a pleasure to discuss with you. Yep, and we'll do it again next time something comes up. And there will also, I, I should point out, will be links to the musical performance, the new paper, etc. in the description below for everybody. Yeah, thanks again. Thanks for listening. I am Futurist and Science John, Fiction Author. Wrong channel. No, it's not. Thanks for listening. I am Futurist and Science Fiction Author John Michael Godier, currently hosting Event Horizon and wondering where Anna actually came from. One day I had a tablet computer, the next I had a boss. Very disturbing. And be sure... And that's enough of that. YouTuber forever! Like, subscribe, and hit the bell! Sell out. What?